And we're back with the question and answer session with Commander One. I realize what that is. That's ten four, isn't it, Commander Ten Four? It's what it's what one zero four because I stole it off of uh, Commander Degree from Star Wars. Okay, there we go. And Commander then, One yeah. One. One, I, I always thought it was like a, a clever way of saying ten four because it's zero four ten zero four. Uh, no, I have I have like three brain cells, so I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, essay uh, as well. Uh, if you want to listen to the previous episode that we we talked about, the previous section we talked about logistics and Star Citizen, you know, current, medium, you know, future things you need to kind of think about when you talk about logistics. Um, it'll be right if you're watching this on YouTube. It'll be right above. Uh, commander's head right there uh and then we'll move on uh we're moving on right now to the question and answer session so with that being said let's get started on that uh first question these are all questions that have been asked by the chat specifically for you know individual members of the cast or for all the cast um hopefully talking a little bit more about the stuff though it's just star citizen in general first question comes from sleazy meyer who asks what are the panel's thoughts on seeing logistics management tool in Star Citizen? Obviously, we're not there yet, but what would you want to see in terms of strategic slash logistic tools to help understand the needs of the large scale action? Um, Essay, go that's ahead. a, I mean, that's an excellent question. I think we all kind of want to know the answer to it. Yeah. Um, what the, uh, you know, uh, there are certain things that you absolutely need. Um, so, one of them is going to be because so we know that certain cargo is going to be volatile. It's going to um, be perishable potentially. Um, some type of cargo management. So one of the things that you see on a container ship is you might be shipping frozen falafel from Saudi Arabia to the United States. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe it's a gourmet product. It, it makes financial sense to do that. That being said, that frozen Connex container ship that's shipping it. Um, while it's being shipped, it can take potentially weeks or months, depending on the route of that container. So in that process, you have management of that container because if it gets to its end result and it's, you know, spoiled product, you've lost the entire load. Now, you might be insured, but the reality is you don't, it interrupts the supply chain. People can't put food on the shelf then. So the ability to just manage cargo, some type of very simple application that can look at a container. And, and, and actually the way I think that CIG is going to go with it because they want um, gameplay for so so I personally believe that trading quote unquote the the logistics portion of it is going to be a really fun um, uh, eventual gameplay because they're really cool things they could do so the prime example that I, I love thinking about is the hull e right you have those spindles that come out mm -hmm. and let's say you have all kinds of different cargo on there that need to be monitored. You need to check the energy levels, potentially fuel that container so that it can continue to stay frozen or keep a certain temperature range, or you need to just check to make sure that your, your livestock that's on it's alive. Maybe that'll be a thing. Um, but it's not in internal storage. So you'd actually have to put on an EV, EVA suit, like the whole, I think the sea has that like little balcony, right? To mm -hmm. go to the outside of the ship. So you have to put on that EVA suit and there's a suit locker and you put it on and you attach yourself into, you know, by potentially a carabiner or something along a, a you know, a, a, a rail and you slowly bring yourself out, like potentially even in quantum or even in, you know, like just not during a jump, but like, you know, yeah. right before a jump or something. And I just think that's, the coolest idea of gameplay like you you potentially would not just need a crew to you know a pilot a co-pilot a captain a cartographer or a or navigator um you might need a doctor because you have medical equipment that's sensitive or or um supplies or livestock a veterinarian like there's all these weird things that they could go with um and i think a lot of this is going to be based on the containers itself so the cargo so, mm -hmm. like, if you have volatile cargo, um, I don't see CIG making it easy, like giving you a Moby Glass screen where you can just be like, all right, is all my cargo good? Scroll, scroll, scroll. Or if they do that, it would be scroll, scroll, scroll. This one is red. And now I have to mm -hmm. put on my EVA suit and run out there to fix the problem before I lose my cargo. Um, and can you, if you imagine doing that with a Hull E, that, like, I think a Hull E is, what, three containers um, deep? Uh, yeah. It? Is it three, by three, three to five containers deep. I think it might be five yeah, it's, full containers. Yeah, I can't remember which ship is which, but you know, if that container's in the middle of all those and you can't even get to it, like yeah. your load planning was bad, then yeah, I mean, so there are all kinds of really interesting things that they could do without a lot of effort. It's just simply get to panel, play mini game on panel, get back in ship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. That's my 
initial thought. I kind of got off track, but yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I, I, I agree with you on that one. I think, I think a lot of people, um, I always think that logistics and planning and gameplay, this sort of thing, a lot of people say, ah, it's boring. It's like, to me, it's like, that's not boring. That's part of the fun is sitting there going, all right, what do I need? How can I do this? What do I need to f- focus on? Uh, it's kind of like how people, I, I, I compare it to mining. Like if you look at what mining is in Star Citizen, it's pretty simple. Scan, uh, turn your laser on, make sure the, 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 it doesn't go into the red, stays in the green, and then it blows up, and then you hoover everything in. That's it. It's not really intensive work, but knowing what kind of rocks to get, how to filter out bad rocks from good rocks, um, and, and, and all of that process is pretty in, in, intensive. Not difficult, but requires experience. And on top of that, it's kind of, you know, just background. It's a hum in the background. You, when you get to it, you just, you're just kind of doing it secondhand. You can almost do anything else while doing it as well, uh, which is a nice kind of experience because if you're, if you're doing it well enough, if that kind of gameplay it hits you well enough, you look down at your, your watch and you're like, holy shit, I've been playing for three hours. What the hell? You know, it doesn't feel like yeah. that, you know? And I think that can happen with, with, with cargo running as well, even if it's like long cargo or things like managing the power on a, on a, on a chilled crate. Cause we already have some of that in game right now. Like uh, the explosive and volatile car- cargo uh, is a big thing. You know, the whole, like one of the reasons why Xeno threat was so fun uh, was because you had to plan who was going to take the slow boating, who was going to take the, uh, the, the, the quantum sensitive stuff versus who's going to take the time sensitive stuff. And how, how do you load it? You know, what, what do you load first? Like that's an example of, of load, load planning. Like, Everyone yeah. knows when you did you did Xeno Threat, you loaded the quantum stuff last. Oh no, you loaded the quantum stuff first, then the then the dangerous stuff, and then the time sensitive stuff lasts. Because if you if you started loading that last, the timer would last you if you could slow boat. You could take an entire ship with all of the um the 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 things you need uh from the crash site to Jericho. Uh, and still make it in, with plenty of time to spare if you loaded it properly. Because if you didn't load it, if you loaded like the green first, you just run out of time and you, you'd blow up and lose everything. So um, that's a good example. Uh, in terms of like what tools, we already talked about that. Like knowing what, what commodity is where, being able to load, you know, load plan. Uh, it's and Tetris. Pound. Yeah, the Tetris. Yeah, it's the ability. And... and- with any ship, they could do it fairly easily, right? Because we, they have the hollow viewer. They could easily internalize, like, it's this grid of standard cargo units. So the unit you put in there, it's like, you know, I have this very large one because we know we're going to get larger containers that fits into an M2. That goes here, and this goes here, and these boxes go here. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's not a complicated mm-hmm. system for them to add, but it could be extremely valuable. Um, you know, you're doing an assault on a planet, and you load your tanks first, and you put your cargo on the end, and you can't get your tanks off. Yeah, like very simple things that right now are somewhat automated. Like there, there's not really a. There are systems; they just aren't where they're going to be. But some way to manage that, um, commodity market stuff, I think, is going to be huge because that's uh, there's a reason why when you look at logistical supply companies, you have brokers, um, you have people that do nothing but track commodity prices and and, and projections. Mm-hmm. You have load planners. You have. Um, you know, there's a variety of different logistical expertise. And then, you know, the, the one that we always think of, you hear about it in the news, at least in the States a lot, is drivers. Mm-hmm. Like an experienced long haul driver is worth their weight in gold because they're going to, they know the routes, they know the, the amount of time, they know when to get sleep, you know, all the little things that can throw off, you know, profitability, they know them. So, yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, route planning is another one an app that actually lets you right now we have the star map and we know we're going to get a second version of it. But one that takes into consideration, am I flying through piracy area? Is mm-hmm. it dangerous? Am I flying through a radiation belt? Am I just gives you basic information? Hey, you're going to pyro. You know, I can't go in a straight line because there is a radiation belt and piracy along the way. So I'm going to do this little thing and come back and get where I need to go. So yeah, apps like that would be very helpful. Any other things you can think of commander in terms of like things that tools that CIG could add? Um, outside of being distracted by falafel, I like I like the <laughs> idea of diversity in cargo. I don't want a lot of handholding from CIG. To me, the more rewarding experience would be having making you be the lore guy who knows all of the systems, 
than me hiring SA to plan the routes and having you two brainstorm the most efficient route to move my cargo. Yeah, it's more fun than having a a, a map, you know, it's a map tool be. that says this is a pirate system. This one has high radiation, mm-hmm. and you're buying perishable foods that's going to expire in forty eight hours. I'd rather have to find someone who knows all of that stuff or fail the first hundred times to learn it myself. It's a lot more rewarding of an experience. I, I think they could, they could, you could meet you. You could see that halfway too, where you have to collect in-game logistic or in-game information, being able to know, go talk to a, 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 a an exploration company that has mm-hmm. maps, updated maps of the region. So, you know, the hazards that are in the area, otherwise you're using old maps. And you have to kind of constantly keep your 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 data in uh, updated, you know. Like, uh, uh, I think that's something we talked about when I was last on. But yeah, yeah, give me give me ways to collect information. Just don't give it to me. Yeah, is the difference. Uh, all right. The next question comes from Sandy Claus, who asks: Should CIG add a tax slash tariff system when buying and selling cargo? Yes. <laughs> that's very. <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's a great question, it, and it adds a lot of complexity to. Um, it gives CIG a very simple mechanic mm-hmm. to discourage product moving to certain systems, which yeah. would artificially drive up the price, which could be put into lore. There's all kinds of really cool ways that they could manipulate that to make gameplay far more interesting. Like Pyro would be a great example, right? Um, there's, you know, like you would think the UEE or whatever security force is going to be monitoring that jump gate for piracy coming up to their side. Mm-hmm. You think that'd be a thing. Um, there's a crew there. They're, they're monitoring it. They're repairing, et cetera. Um, there might be a legitimate reason to bring aid to Pyro where there's just a particular tariff on it or only certain things get through. Um, another form of tariffs in, in, and in, um, in fees would be, um, you know, because there are a lot of things you could do would be actually um, bribing. Mm-hmm. The ability to bring things to certain systems by a mechanic where an NPC you could risk, you know, like that's my favorite thing about D&D, right? The risk, like the the ability to say, like, can I really get this role? Yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I have 18 in this and I'm going to freaking go for it. Um, you know, it's when you roll that that two or that one that you're just like, oh, okay, great. Like, I now I'm going to fight. Um, mm-hmm. I just tried to bribe the wrong cop. Like those yeah. things are, in a way, that's a tariff in itself. Yeah. I, I was proposed. Good. Because the fun gameplay of smuggling stuff in, mm-hmm. it may not be illegal, but if I can get a 10% raise on just blowing past security and delivering my Quantanium somewhere, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, and then it ups your risk. You might have to fight. You might, yeah. bl- bl- you might blow your reputation in that area because like, you know, no one knows that you're a smuggler until you get caught. Now suddenly, ah, shit. Now I, everyone mm-hmm. knows I'm a smuggler here. I can't run, run, run this route anymore. You know, and then, what's a better smuggling ship? Is it the Hall E where you could hide like two boxes of something that are extremely illicit that may never be found? Or is it mm-hmm. the MSR that everyone's going to look at fly by and be like, you know, Popo is going to be like, woo, yeah. come pull you yeah. over because oh, yeah, you're an MSR. You have a hidden compartment area. Yeah. Like, you know, I've, I've always said that the 315P is going to be one of the best smuggling ships just because yeah. it's no one's going to think about it. It's just some rich kid's ship, right? You know, it's got no, no one, everyone forgets that it has uh, sh- tons of cargo space that you are that is, that is internal that you may even be able to buy things like um, uh, shielded cargo crates that will like spoof what's what you what can be seen inside that 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 crate as well. Um, I've so always hoped for it that they, they would have uh, fake components. Yeah. So like you might have a shield generator that looks like a shield generator. You open it up. It's like filled with a list of drugs. That'd be awesome. Yes. I'd those those things would be cool. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I think the other thing to remember about with the tax and tariff system is that uh, it will also add a, um, a money sink to, to the game. So that with like when you're playing stuff, you, you're going to have to be reducing the profits. So someone isn't just going to be able to, mass buy stuff the the you got to balance it but like everything in, in in games in general balancing is important uh sand Groper asks what is your emotional support ship essay i already answered this one in the in the, the pre-show um the carrick like i just like this image behind me that's because mm-hmm. the, the only reason i have this image is because i can't take an image right now looking at a jump gate out of the window of my captain's quarters on my carrick like the, the carrick to me is my romantic like you know, I'm going to go, it, it's my serenity, basically. Mm-hmm. Thinking of it like that, um, I would say my Banyo Merchantman, for me, be me, 
because it's like what I want. I, I want to make a bar. And so the banding merchant <laughs> is like, like one of those ways I'm like, I could, I might be able to make a bar out of this ship. So, uh, commander, what is your emotional support ship? As it, as it stands, the eclipse, but there's only cause there's no better <laughs> feeling than connecting a torpedo into a 600 eye. Especially if they don't know you're there. <laughs> Especially if they don't know I'm there. <laughs> when they're like Man, contact or not even contact, like a, like a, you, they just see the, the, the alert that a missile missile is, warning. Is, you yeah. have one kilometer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like what? Uh, all right. Next question comes from Death Trooper One Seven Seven, who asks, uh, "How do you think orgs will distribute wealth and resource uh, um, resources accurately and fairly among some player that has no life um, or casual flares?" I think he's talking about like. Distributing resources between, um, you know, no lifers versus like casuals. How would orgs, you know, deal with that? Um, I would imagine it would be some type of uh, something on Spectrum or some other app that would allow you to. This is your organization management. You can then distribute these things. So, from a mechanical standpoint, that's what I would think it would be. Mm -hmm. um, but from an actual gameplay, I think the orgs that are going to be the most successful are the ones that really do equity sharing. Mm -hmm. So the ones that actually get are more um, like it's socialist is the wrong word, but basically are like, hey, you may not have log logged in for two weeks because you're doing stuff, but like you get a portion of this because you've contributed, you've loaned ships, you've done all these things. There's going to be some calculation we make. Mm -hmm. You get to to have this much profit from a mission you weren't even involved in because you're you were supporting the org. Yeah. Um, you know, the orgs that, uh, I mean, I remember in Galaxies, I was a shortly, very, very briefly a member of an org when I first joined. That was very much a like, you should feel privileged to be part of this org. And that lasted maybe a week. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I, I wanted to feel like I was part of a group. I had joined a smaller org and we built a city. We had a great time, you know, and we all just constantly threw things into the org and the org constantly, you know, like gave back to us and we were, we had fun playing. We were very successful. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think the answer is also is it'll depend. It'll depend on the, the org. Uh, some <clears> people <throat> are going to be super, super hardcore, and they're like, you, they expect you to be super, super hardcore. Um, I think what you'll likely see is some sort of hybrid between the two, where like the people who are working the most are going to get most of the money, but yeah. they'll also, in, a lot of those people will reinvest back into the org. So like, yeah, I got money, but I'm going to go buy this equipment for the org so that when those more casual players come on the their advantage of them being part of that organization is that they can get access to these this gear that they don't have normally so they can they can get this specialized you know uh armor that they can they can they can wear they can practically just throw it away when they're done because they just you know their org has all of this stored up for them to use uh, what do you think commander uh, welcome to the question that started your s1 shop um, but yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna depend on how your org wants to do it. Uh, again, some orgs will only pay based on participation. I will say people will only stick around as long as they feel valued, because it's yeah. it's a video game. They don't really care about space bucks. They want a community to play with. So as long as you're as some way making sure that most of your people feel like they they're valued and that their time playing with you is rewarding in some fashion. You're doing the right thing. And additionally, it would behoove you to make sure everyone in your org is at least outfitted enough to perform the operation you gave them. Other than that, it's up to no. you and your S1. No, supply? No, S4? No. Why would they, <laughs> why would they prepare you? Yeah, no, <laughs> never. They're the ones who charge you for shoe polish you never used and then don't give you your plate carrier back. That's this <laughs> Yeah, like I've, I have a shout out to any veterans in the, you know, no matter where you're at, any country, CIF, um, turning in gear. Yeah, it's the worst experience you ever have in the military. I ended up, I ended up just buying all of my gear out. Yeah, I, I've like, actually kept stuff and been like, I'm not turning it in. I'm also one of those collectors where I literally, I'm, I'm still in the reserves. I have a box full of just like random gear. And when my soldiers like are missing something, I just like reach in the box, like, here, man, go turn that in. Like just <laughs> yeah, random my, stuff. Uh, like, yeah. The last unit I was at, whenever someone signed off, they took all of their stuff and they go, who needs it? And they'll give it out first before they went to CIF. And you just ate that hundred bucks for a plate carrier or a helmet. 
Um, for, 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 we have a, I have a similar, much more minor version. I think it's just government work that does this is, that <laughs> is, is when I'm as, as a teacher, you do very simply, simply, you have to sign out every little piece of equipment that this, the school has and you have to return it. And, uh, you know, the problem is, is that I have stuff in my room that I never signed for that was given to me that I've just had. So whenever <laughs> like someone comes in, it's like, Hey, who needs a, like, uh, someone comes is like, Hey, I need a, 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 like a projector. I'm like, which one? I've got like six of them. <laughs> I don't know why I have six of them. I just have six of them. I never signed for them. They were just here when I when I showed up. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, my uh, wife's a teacher and has a very. We, we talk about that. We have the very similar experience of just like this. Like we gotta watch out for each other. Like soldiers have to watch out for each other. Teachers <laughs> yeah. have to watch out for each other. Yeah, it's like the civil service professions. You know, it's like you definitely are. Like, hey, you know, we might not be friends, but we're all getting screwed. So let's fight <laughs> the man. We're collectively getting <laughs> fucked, so it's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Next question comes from uh, MMO um, M Morgoth, who asks, uh, "What would pave the way for the first step of CIG towards the implementation of science gameplay loop? Would it be Quanta? Mm. Would it be a second solar system really needed? In short, what is the stepping stone we are waiting for for science gameplay?" I, uh, I will, I'll answer first. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what CIG is defining <laughs> in science right now. Uh, yeah. Probably a bit of Quanto to start with, but I have yeah. no idea what they intend us to do. I think it depends on what you define as science gameplay, because I think there's, like, if you're talking about, like, gathering resources or gathering samples and taking it back to a lab somewhere, um, that probably requires the actual gameplay to be coded for that. But... I think like right now you could do science gameplay, which is just go to this area, take this bespoke tool, stick it in the ground, pull it out and then go back and, and turn it back in. You know, um, it, it, it's a broad concept science gameplay. Yeah, I, I would agree with with uh, both of you. I'd also add, though, that like I think the first system, the in-game system, I think that we'll get that'll be the the gateway drug to science gameplay is going to be scanning mm -hmm. the improvement of scanning, the ability to actually get into whatever that gameplay is. And if you're um, commander and I had a conversation previously about this, like we there's signal collection, there's all these different things you can do. They all overlap. There's like a really broad, you know, form of gameplay there that is a tapestry of ships and capabilities. Cause there's not going to be one ship that does things perfectly. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, uh, Tecton who's, who's been on a couple of info renders episode, I think on one of your shows, Paul mm -hmm. um, was talking about ground penetrating radar which has a military purpose and it also has a commercial purpose. So that is a form of scanning that will allow you to say what is in this asteroid, what is in this planetoid that I cannot see for larger bodies. Um, and then you have like the Terrapin completely, you know, like, and isn't it the prospector that has one underneath it? Like yeah. a ground pen? Yeah. yeah. So um, then you have the Terrapin, which is completely different. It's got a dish on top, but that's looking for more signal and energy. And then you have, your e-warfare suites that might capture actual communications. So, and, and all those things lead to science in my view, because they allow you to look beyond your physical, I see that ship in front of me. And suddenly, like I see things within a planet or within a ship or within space, like radiation belts, et cetera, that I may not physically be able to see currently. And that leads to that, that science gameplay in my mind, at least. Yeah, I agree. Science. I think, I think that's, that's, that's the key is, is being able to differentiate all of those signals and fil filter it out. That's, that's probably the beginning of science gameplay. Sorry, Commander. I think, uh, I think we're on the long wait for science and exploration because they have to, CIG has to define what's the known universe first. Yeah. And we're not even one system in. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, uh, it's also probably the most hotly anticipated type of gameplay. So CIG is going to, that's going to save, they're, they're going to save that to the last to make sure that they have mm -hmm. all the systems in place. Yeah properly so that when you're doing science and exploration it's going to feel good rather than being tier zero and it's i have science science gun i i use science beam to to scan ground beam collect data data go back and put put gun in you know uh amazon box now you're done like it, to make it less of a go fetch chip sort of thing i think uh, science mainly is going to be a um and I'm not trying to downplay it and say you shouldn't invest in a science ship if that's the sh what you want to do in game, but mm -hmm. it's going to be more of an analysis game than anything else. Like I got a plant from this planet. I take it up to my Carrick. I have a lab. I analyze it. I've identified a new plant 
It has these properties can be potentially, and then I have to figure out what it can be used for. Um, so I think it's going to be this more utilitarian style of gameplay. It won't be the, you know, it's going to be a lot of analysis, a lot of being very good at recognizing certain things, like little nuances, kind of like we talked about with other things. Like, mm-hmm. But um, unfortunately, I don't think, I mean, I don't think it's possible in a game to really get into research, like to yeah. get into like, I'm going to develop something better, May, unless it's just a, a ticker, like a clock that's going, it's like, I'm going to make this, you know, capacitor you know, function better this way. And I've gotten all the parts together in pieces and I've paid my money and now a, a timer is going to go off. And when it's done, mine's going to be 0.01 more efficient than the best one currently in the verse. Like, yeah. yeah the super collider game, for example, I have no idea what that could be. That's just, I, yeah. I, I even... my, my, my experience is there's a couple of games out there that do this and it's going to probably what, what it's, this is what it's going to be. And it's going to suck for a lot of people. Um, for those of you who don't know, historically, how the incandescent or the, the the light bulb effectively was created was um, the uh, Edison took and his team took like 150 different materials to see which would you know glow better and they just they just they just trial and error the whole thing they just kept doing it and over and over and over and over again <laughs> and then they find out that it was effectively burnt cardboard that was the best incandescent, you know, like layer um, and, you know, carbon. And so they, so that, that's that, but they, they were just doing it over and over again. I think that's what you're going to, your research is probably going to be. I take green plant. I take purple plant. Let's throw it into the hopper and see what happens. Oh, it came out with medicine. You know, yeah. uh, I think that's probably more trial and error is what you're going to see. So, um, so uh, how you craft potions in Skyrim is science. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I think it like yeah, ca- crafting potions in Skyrim, the, the, the old or the, just just in general, most games like how do you enchant or craft? You just throw random things together and see what happens, you know. Uh, all right. Next question comes from Dracolith, who asks, "What is everyone's opinion using the Liberator as a forward operating base for repair, refuel, and rearm?" Uh, outside of that, it can't do those things. You would need a Vulcan <laughs> attach, probably. Uh, but as as it stands in my little. My little two Oryx deliberators are at FOB for now. Mm-hmm. And it works because uh, you can bring a lot of force to bear in that little tiny ship. Hopefully it doesn't blow up immediately and it carries a good bit of cargo. So you could bring whatever supplies you need to sustain an op for a good portion of a day. And then you slap a Vulcan on the back and you can do your repair, rearm, and refuel. If it fits. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah, which it won't. But like, I mean, it's it's... Badgers and I had a really good conversation about this. Um, like we both agree that the Liberator is a transport ship. It's not mm-hmm. a, it's a, a support ship. So yeah, it, yeah, it's a ferry. It's a glorified ferry. Mm-hmm. But that being said, we don't know where cargo is going in the real long term, which is one thing we haven't talked about with logistics and support are, and military people will understand this. When you get on a C-130 or C-7, C-5, whatever it's going to be, there are lockable grids you can put in the floor. So when you see a picture of a, a C-130 with, with, um, seats in it in the middle, or C5, or whatever it's going to be for troop transport, those are actually cargo grids that they're mm-hmm. locking into place in the floor. And I really hope CIG goes this route, because it could be that in the storage area of the Liberator, that little side compartment, or maybe in the main bay, you could put like a repair station. Yeah. Um, you know, So you're sacrificing cargo. There, there's a calculation you're making. Like, what am I giving up for what am I gaining? And yeah, it might be that you don't run vehicles in that bay. That bay is nothing but your, there's fuel tanks that are locked in or something like that. And mm-hmm. that would be really cool. It would give flexibility to ships and customization that I think we all want. We want that modular, you know, I see a retaliator in the distance. It could be a cargo hauler. It could have, you know, messed me up really badly. I don't yeah. know because ships can be customized. And I mean, I want to customize my ships. I, yeah. I have a, uh, one of my ships is a blue. Um I've, I loved the original concept. I'm not thrilled with it, but I still have it. And I want to remove at least half of those cells. Mm-hmm. You know, can I put a med bed in cells? That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I wholly suspect to get ship customization, and I'm sorry for cutting no, you off. So. Um, to say that the Vulcan won't fit on the Liberator, give Reddit a day, and they'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cat rules. Yeah. If they can make it sit, if they make it fit, it sits. It, it works, but... 
I've I've always I've always envisioned cargo is going to be place it on your little grid and it kind of can mm -hmm. you lock it down in that spot so you can put whatever you needed there. Yeah, and, and, and they already have that. They're like the, if you look at the the floor, they have these little like mesh weaves that you can kind of see, which re represents like where the where the cargo is. Even on the freelancer, you can see like it's marked off in white like paint. This is cargo grid. This is the area where the cargo will be. You can walk around here. And I think I think I think you're right though, SA. That I think that's going to be the this is the 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 block that you can lock down, and you know this cargo container is you know twice two two cargo container two blocks wide, so it'll lock down these two that kind of thing. So, and it's silly if they don't because all you have to do is like you know I I believe personally they're going to make a version of the Atlas platform that's going to be a yeah. supply truck just with boxes. So if you could just park that and lock that down to the inside of the Liberator with cargo on it. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you just be able to lock cargo to it when the vehicle itself can lock down? Like, it's it, yeah. it seems like an eventual thing they're going to move to. Mm -hmm. um, but it's speculation. I mean, it's we don't know. Uh, if you're looking for a forward operating base, I think the best ship that's probably for a forward operating base would be a Kraken. Ooh, I disagree. I think it's the Idris. Oh, the Idris might work. I think, the, I, I think I'm going to second Paul here. It's going to be the Kraken. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would think the Kraken only because it has more flexibility because it can fit those larger ships on top of it. And it's got that big deck, which is could support like in theory, like uh, ships close to Connie size. And it has a lot of internal space. It sacrifices a lot of its yeah. weapons for livability and, and and like just being able to work because it's got its own repair bay dedicated to it. Uh, the Idris is good, but the Idris is much more of a, I would say, a combat forward operating base. It's whereas, like, and, and that's the way I'm viewing it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. That's a different assessment. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would also say it depends on how long your campaign's going to be. Mm -hmm. If you're fighting someone in that little that little planet you're going for, it's going to be a month. Just drop a pioneer there and put a mm -hmm. proper base. Build one. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, like, say, like. The, the advantage of something like a, uh, a Kraken would be it could work as a mining forward operating base. It could m m work as a uh, yeah. like a mobile base. It could work as a, a you know, uh, logistical support. You could just park that thing anywhere and it becomes a station. And now you've got a, a nice little spot where you can dump off a bunch of supplies and, you know, people come by, you know, refuel, rep repair, rearm and move on. Uh, so and this is a beautiful part about Star Citizen, which is when I hear FOB, I instantly go to military because that's yeah. where I've lived and that's what I've done. And like yeah. the reality is like star citizens, what you make it, your Ford operating base can be a mining, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a pre mining colony slash small footprint. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great way to look at it. Like it's the ship depends on what you really are intending to do. I, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Chief colleagues in the chat saying tactical operation centers, but yeah, I mean, but in, in you, you'd probably have to yeah. use an older term for what I'm talking about, which is forts. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what, which is, you know, when you're on the frontier and you need a place that's protected from the elements and from hostile forces nearby, but it's, you know, most forts in the American frontier were military bases second and um, trading hubs first. So, or, or some logistical supply uh, hubs first. The military aspect was there, but very rarely would you see, uh, you know, extensive military operations at a fort unless there was some sort of operation going on in that region. Most forts were just there to protect settlers and make sure settlers weren't starving to death. <laughs> you know, on their I wouldn't. Way. I wouldn't West. be uh, surprised if Star Citizen takes on after real life, where you place your little fort yeah. down and the city grows around it. Even in that'd like be super cool, yeah. That'd even be in, like technical, like the last place it was on Erbils, like it's technically a combat zone. We get rocketed every day, but there's <laughs> a huge city around it, and it's you just mm -hmm. walk out a gate, there, you're in Erbil City. What people don't realize about like things like this is that. Um, especially when you join operations or you have uh, other multinational, um, you will create something, you'll be working with partner forces and like little villages will pop up around an actual combat base. Mm -hmm. And it's the weirdest thing in the world. Cause like, you don't want to be here. Like, this is not a good idea. We get mortared. Like you should go a little bit further away. No, no. Like I, I work here. I cook food. I do this. It's like, all right, cool. Like, you know, I'm, it's your life. It's your world. I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. They, they see private snuffy and they know they get paid every other Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, the thing. So, I was going to say, like, historically, that's always the case. Every time mm -hmm. in history where the military sets up a base, there is a town that is nearby it because yeah, the support. support it. Yeah. yeah. Now, one thing I do want to bring up because it's in chat and I see it is what a talk is. So to explain to, to folks that aren't familiar with it. So a tactical operations center is basically 
um, a mobile. So, so people that have been in the military have done, have been involved with these. They've seen them. It's basically a mobile command center. Mm -hmm. So it is where the commander would be located and it is usually built up within a matter of hours. So imagine showing up to land where someone is recon is done like, Hey, we're going to put this here. And that's not a permanent position. So when we're talking about a fob. You're talking about something that's actually contractually and, and over time built up to like have, um, fortifications, towers, things that you would have, a talk literally can do what they call jump. So you can break it down within a small period of time, load it all up and take it somewhere new. Um, and in the civilian world, that's actually a thing as well. So you'll see these, these um, mobilization centers, the ability to, if you're doing surveying or something where you might need to set up a small lab um, very quickly, use it. And once you're done, you would just break it down into a truck or whatever and leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that, that you you'll civilians will see it more often with like uh disaster sites you'll see tactical operations that are yeah. set up they often set up in like the the, par point, the parking yeah. lots uh, or in schools those are those are those are also tactical operations basically places where you coordinate all your information from but they're usually temporary yeah sorry and that that depends on your org and your mission set um my org our 600 meter target is to basically be a little insurgent that's going throughout UE space. Um, we're going to live out of a couple Krakens. Mm -hmm. We're never, never going to be able to put down a fob somewhere. So what, uh, God, I can't actually read that. It's chief. What? I'm chief sorry, I can't read the screen. Chief Gully. Sorry, chief. Um, so tack talk and fob are the progression to the capabilities in, in mobility, I guess would be the best way to put it for civilian purposes, non jargon purposes. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, I've, I, I, and, and, you know, I've actually been, and I'm sure a lot of people have back of an NRAP or something, and you're basically operating as a command center, quote unquote, or a mission control point or, you know, whatever it's going to be, um, because that's just what you have. That's where you're at. That's the resources you have. And I think in Star Citizen, the beauty of where they're going with it is they are kind of like what Commander said earlier. I, I think they're kind of painting, they're not painting the picture, they're letting us paint the picture, but they're providing the frame. Mm -hmm. So... We can't go outside those lines, but they're giving us all the systems that give us all the things that we need where I would love to see like an M2 with an entire org operating out of the back of an M2. Because if mm -hmm. they could do it, I'd be shocked and it'd be cool to just see. Yeah. Some, someone, someone's needs must, you know, kind of situation. So some, there'll be someone who runs an entire like small invasion out of the back of a, a, yeah. a freelancer or a cutlass because that's where the technology that they have is. So... <laughs> Um, All right, I will do it, and I'll make CIG write about me. <laughs> I'll be the one who flips. I will take out the soul system from a freelancer. <laughs> All right, the next question comes from Death Trooper 177th, who asks, do you guys think logistics will be a problem that will stop or prevent players from playing combat roles due to fleet constant upkeep and cost of cap ships or cruisers, especially combat orgs? It's yes. a very short answer, yes. I I, th I think the the answer is that CIG is going to have to walk the line. They're going to have to. They're never going to go one to one with logistics and requirements. Like like to run to take a forty one ton tank from point A to point B, and then have that tank operate in a combat zone requires a stupid amount of people and resources, and fuel uh, places for the tankers to sleep, uh, you know, place, safe places for them to, 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 like, get away from the front lines. And a tank in itself has hundreds of thousands of parts that they have to replace on a constant basis just from normal operations. It also depends on, like, how old it is. Star Citizen, the Nova, is not going to have nearly as much complexity. But it's still uh, going to be more complex than you think, you know. It 100% comes down to how complex the IG wants to be. But the military, we have a tooth to tail, which is your combat support to your logistical support. And it's changed throughout history. Like the American Civil War, it was roughly 35 combatants to one logistic person. Mm -hmm. And we get to now where if you you know read like Russia, they do a one to one and you could just see how poorly they've been performing logistically. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. It, I could see I could see. I don't. I don't think it'll be a one to one, but I could see a three to one or possibly a two to one. And if you don't have people who enjoy logistics, logistics gameplay, pay them better or mm -hmm. pay someone else a lot better, yeah. or you cut down on your combat forces. 
So um, I've already, this is the weirdest thing in the world to me, but there is an org that a friend of mine that is a civilian is in that they want to do military contract work. And they've actually, they haven't made an offer, but they said like, we might be willing to pay you to help us plan because we know how much time it's going to take. And they're right. It's going to take a ton of time. But the idea that like, that very well could be a thing. There might be people that actually make real world money from planning logistics because it's mm-hmm. so complicated. It's like, what am I not thinking about that's going to end my trip? You know, that's going to cause a complete failure for an org, especially large orgs. Mm-hmm. Um, not to get, you know, into the current world events, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, but like for those of us that trained to fight near peer competitors like Russia and China and this type of stuff, and, and I don't mean like, we intend to fight them, but you prepare, right? You always look at like, I need to, you know, understand this potential enemy. Um, we're all looking at what's going on and we're just like, what the actual F? Like we are just completely dumbfounded by what's going on because we had built them up to be a particular force in what we're seeing in reality. And that's the key reality. Um, and Star Citizen be the same way. Like what you mm-hmm. actually see happen is never what you plan for. Yeah, you, you um, look so at, you need to have the most diverse planning possible so that you can react and adjust. Yeah, you, you like I, I like. You, you can take one look at something like like Test Squadron. They're fucking massive, mm, like twenty thousand yeah. people. But how many of those people can be called to action at any given moment? And how much experience do they have at combat or whatever they need to do? But you don't want to sit there and go, "Oh, they're all just idiots." You want to say, "All right, if I'm going to have to fight Test Squadron, I need to know how I can beat twenty thousand people." You know, who do I need? Where do I need to go? What, 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 how are we going to pl- uh, practice that? Because when you get to that actual combat situation where you, you don't want to have to, but if you do, then you want to be prepared for the worst because that then it'll be easier. <laughs> so On the counter to that, though, if they have poor organization yeah. and they haven't actually built themselves into the right both individual organization and logistical support, um, I'd want to fight them. You yeah. could see a 200 person org devastating them if they were that, if they were completely unprepared. Yeah. So I'm not saying that's where they're at. And what I'm saying is that size, you know, the whole like Yoda thing, size matters not. Mm-hmm. Like it's mm-hmm. a real thing. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not important. You know, the, I think the, the general convention now is you want nine to one power. Mm-hmm. So you want to be nine times more powerful than the enemy you're fighting. Um, overwhelming force. That's the way yeah. to do it. But you could have overwhelming force if you're not properly trained and supported, you know, Good luck. I've I've been at Jump Town, just me on my own against 25 people orgs, and I was able to hold them up the whole day because they just didn't know how to react to contact. Mm-hmm. And to uh, to plug my org, if you need intelligence on Test Squadron, I will sell uh, <laughs> I'll sell myself out. <laughs> wow. And and my my last my last little point here is to bring it to like chess is the best way to think about planning is a really really great chess players don't get into their next, they don't plan two moves ahead. They just have a vague idea of what they want to do. So if you can be plan your one, two steps and just be agile of what's going to happen for your third move, you'll be a lot better at planning than most people. Yeah. Yeah. Planning is having a, a bag full of um, reactions. Is the I'm trying to do non-jargon stuff. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the two phrases that we always hear used are like, um, react to contact. Like you never know how you're going to be in a firefight until someone shoots at you. And the second one is you never know how you're going to be in a fight of some until someone punches you in the face. Yes. And I've heard that in logistics, <laughs> yeah, you, you will get punched in the face. Yeah. And it, it's about like what's in your bag that you can pull out to say, you know, okay, so this happened, it didn't work out. How am I going to react to this? What are my what are my tools that I'm going to be able to bring to the to the table? And the first time you do it as an org, you're going to fail. So if your mm-hmm. org is telling you like oh, we know exactly how everything's going to work and these ships will operate and this is what we're going to do. They just have the best laid plan to this point because the ships aren't even through their platinum, gold, whatever metal standard they're going to do. Um, So, you know, the most important thing is that you have an org, you know, especially if you're going to be a good logistical support org, that you don't expect them to have all the answers, but make sure that they don't think they know all the answers. Like, you know, that if you're looking at an org and they're like, oh, yeah, we know exactly how everything's going to function and we have a plan for everything, um, they're wrong yeah. because the game's on out. It changes patch to patch, too. If, yeah. you, if you don't, if you don't yeah. practice, you know. All right. Um, so 
some of these we're going to kind of I'm going to kind of cut through some of them because I think because we we still have 23 questions left. So I'm going to pause the questions. <laughs> no, we're we're good. It's just, it's talking. Uh, some of these are stuff that we've already we've probably are, we'll, we've already covered. So we're just going to cut through them. Um, Heroes Shade asks, what level of granula- granulality should we ultimately expect from a logistic standpoint in the economy? For instance, will a bar of random uh, Lagrange point close if they don't receive enough shipments of booze? <laughs> um, I hope so. <laughs> my, my expectation from CIG, based off of CIG's own discussions, is I don't expect a full-fledged economy. I expect a basic reflection of, a, of economy, economics 101 economy, one that wouldn't actually exist in reality because, you know, people make more than two products, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you know, Hurston will produce maybe 10 things um, in, in uh, you know, possibly more, but they're not going to produce like they'll produce things that that in lore make sense for them. But a, a planet like Hurston wouldn't just make hydrogen bombs and missiles and guns. They'd also make, like, food. And they'd probably make more food than they need, so they'd have a surplus so they wouldn't have to import. Or medical supplies or, uh, you know, clothing. And, and not just clothing, but, like, shirts, T-shirts, um, uh, jackets, uh, pants, uh, you know, sw- slacks, uh, dress shoes, formal shoes, uh, work boots. Uh, respirators, like like everything you can think of that a company like Hurston would make would need uh, would 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 create needs some sort of resources with it. I do not think that CIG is going to go that that granular. I think they'll go this general commodity, this general commodity, and then these specific items that they produce. Um, like I don't I don't think you're gonna you're gonna be transporting you know two hundred SCU of spaghetti. <laughs> to to Hurston. You'll transport 200 SEU of food <laughs> and it'll be perishable, non-perishable. Uh, and you might have some specific things like space cow meat, but that'll be yeah, the, the, I, the main difference. I could see him getting to, into some like specifics when it comes down to like uh, Benny's, for example. Yeah. Like they might be like, you might be shipping Benny's products to a particular station because they have a kiosk there. Or I forget what the hot dog place is, but like I could see yeah. them being branded you know, very similar to like McDonald's or, or yeah. Burger King, whatever it's going to be. Um, no, I mean, you're, you're dead, right. Like there's no, the, the economy, the lore economy that exists, like Hurston being what it is, um, our corp being another example, it just wouldn't be that way. Like there's not a, if a corporation owned an entire planet and had turned it into nothing but factories that produce product, like how many things could they make before they oversaturate the market? They would diversify mm-hmm. what they're producing. So yeah, I agree entirely with what Paul said. I think it's going to be hand wavium of like, you know, we're not um, in the military. We have um, uh, numbers that mean you can order parts or things. So it could be like, like a, a case of uh, bullets has a number. And if you mm-hmm. order that um, you'll get a case of bullets through the right chain. Um, and then you have a screw that goes into an MRAP or a, a joint fighting vehicle, whatever it's going to be. Um, and all those things are cataloged because you have to com- constantly like uh, repair, resupply, et cetera. That being said, like that isn't going to be a thing in Star Citizen. It just, yeah. It's so many millions of little tiny things, it just wouldn't happen. So what they're going to say is parts. Mm-hmm. or food or supplies or water or whatever it's going to be or and they'll just have like a a uh, my personal view a catalog of logos kind of like how they've done like we need brands mm-hmm. and they'll just say this is um Hurston MREs meals ready to eat for the military yeah. like they they make them and they just their logos on it and it's a bag and a case and there you go all the soldiers eat this and we can just move forward we don't even look back at it yeah they'll simplify it and and Part of that is also just from a gameplay's perspective, it just doesn't make any sense. You don't, A, if your Nova tank is broken down, you don't need to figure out how to replace the tracks and the pins that require to go into that those tracks and, and you know, each individual slot and all that kind of stuff. No, your ship, if it's going to be broken, you're going to have repair tool go. Beam me, you know, more repairs, you know, this sort of thing. You're not going to be replacing the, the tires on your cyclone. You'll be just hitting a repair button or doing a repair thing. Um, you know, you'll, you'll 
you'll likely, you know, uh, well, tires, tires might actually be something you replace, but you're not going to replace the engine block of a cyclone. You'll, you'll have some sort of generic repairing that you will be doing to repair it. Um, yeah, I, I could see like, I could see having, having to order like specialized materials or parts to repair yeah. something. So like a, like a Hornet, for example, you may have a, the, the hand wavium gun that puts the wing back or the, the skin on the wing, but the frame yeah. of the wing may need to be ordered. Yeah, something like that. Um, you're, and you're, you'll replace components themselves, but you won't replace like the wiring inside a Gladius. Yeah, That'll be yeah. something you have to order or you, you make and it'll just be 3D printed, you know, sort of thing. I think uh, yeah. that speaks to what CIG is trying to do with every loop. They want to make it complex enough that you feel pressure to source to a specialist who enjoys that gameplay. Yeah. But not too much pressure that you're looking at universities to get a second degree. Yeah. <laughs> not that level of specialization. Uh, all right. Chief Gully asks, is Commander a, um, a Kindo a pr- practitioner? It's K-I-N-D-O. Kendo. Kendo. I think uh, it's Kendo. Yeah. He's asking about the Vulcan back there. I was yeah. once upon a time, but okay. not anymore. <laughs> time and uh, life, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Goki asks, how will the cargo refactor affect logistics? A lot. <laughs> yeah. It will redo logistics. Yeah. A cargo uh, refactor is uh, step one in logistics gameplay. Yeah, yeah there's definitely That's a... That's define it. There's going to be a progression. Like it's going to be the, the example I would use is if you have um, a hull A on the side of it with standard cargo units stacked, right? The cargo units themselves take up space. So mm-hmm. right now it's hand wavy them. They all have a certain value inside. If you have one container on that, you actually have more overall internal space. Now is that going to be something we see immediately? No, but they've already told us that there's going to be crating and other things that will exist in there. So crating is when you have a capacitor. It might take up so many units, but it's going to be housed in a box, and therefore it's not worth those SEUs, but it will take up a certain footprint. Mm -hmm. So when we actually get to the actual footprint reality of cargo, which is part of that, um, yeah, it's going to change a lot of things. It's going to make... um, well, we're, we're talking about with that specialization and getting to know your profession, mining, like John Citizen, who does mining, he's amazing, right? So mining isn't complex, but he's the best I've ever seen at it. Like, I, I can't compete with him, and I enjoy doing mining from time to time. I just never put that much energy into it. It's going to be the same thing. You're going to get uh, cargo managers and traders that are like, my ship is best at doing this to this point to this with these things on it. And they're just going to know their game uh, and play it. Yeah. Um, I think at least initially for a car, the initial cargo refactor, I would expect three things. Oh. Number one, timers. You're no longer going to have magic hand wavium popping into existence. You may have popping into existence slowly, but they'll, there'll be a timer upon which, which is simulating the loading and offloading of those, of that cargo. And the other thing to, to, to keep in count is uh, cargo loading and unloading manually. If you want to take that and you want to give it to somebody else, you're going to have to figure out how to how to how to load it and unload it properly. Um, so I don't think they're going to do like cargo load niche initially in terms of like mass. What they'll probably do is, do you want to take so like you're making a delivery and you're you're buying this and you need to sell, you know, you say you're buying aluminum and food at this one place because it has a surplus of both of them. And you're going to sell the aluminum at Port Olisar and the food at uh, Hurston, at, at Lorville. Well, which one are you going to first? You better have, make sure that the stuff that's loaded in um, the back is the is the one you're unloading first, because otherwise you're going to have to unload everything and then load those back unload those back in, which may increase your timer, those sorts of things. So uh, that, that that's probably what you're going to be looking at is in terms of initial versions. Yeah, last and first out. All right. Um, next question comes from Nightcob, who asks, it's been theorized that the expanse being rushed out is in reaction to a CIG re- realization that Pyro will introduce new logistical complications to existing gameplay loops. What other potential pitfalls do you see them in terms of missing logistics that they'll need to hurry, in, hurry and fill in prior to the in- introduction of Pyro? Uh, the Vulcan, please. Yeah. <laughs> 
Liberator? Uh, I was just thinking of uh, Liberator. Yeah, that's Liberator. For sure. too. Yeah. But yeah, thinking in as a combat person who does that, there's no staying power in Pyro. Uh, you get chained to Ruin Station. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you don't like playing nice with the gangs there, you're not going to be in Pyro. So, but if you had the Vulcan, you could stay out for much longer. At least, or at the very least, putting ballistic ammo and missiles in a box and mm -hmm. having you open that box and throw it on your ship. Yeah, some way of like manually doing that. Uh, what do yeah, you think? I mean, I, I yes, can... I'll be right back as well. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, well, modularity. Mm -hmm. um, we know that's on. I don't. I, it won't be there. I, I don't believe it'll be there when Pyro comes into existence because they've been talking about it. Um, I know that uh, they're probably further along than any of us know for modularity and where it's going to go. But the ability to do things like add additional fuel tanks internally to the Retaliator. I'm not saying they're going to do that. Those aren't the modules that have been released for it, but like the ability to um, give ships flexibility that don't currently have them. Because right now you take a Retaliator there, and like you said, if you don't have a Vulcan, I mean, I agree 100% with what you said, uh, Commander. Like Vulcan is the... Uh, I don't see how they launch Pyro without Vulcan, without a Vulcan. It just... It would or at least, at least some gameplay loop that, yeah, some like, gameplay I mean, loop fills it. If they put so many stations that you can still, you know, jump to them and they have a couple of starfares that'll fill, you know, organizations that'll go out with starfares and refuel, then yeah, you can go get ammo at a station that will eventually be mo removed from Pyro. Like, that's mm -hmm. a that's a likelihood. Um, I thought it would, like, I would like to see the Cry Astro stations come back. Do the small and, ones? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, and all you can do is rearm. And refuel mm. there, and then uh, as the game goes on, they just get abandoned. I would love to see the older space stations actually added mm -hmm. to Pyro. Something There's that's a, a little like the blockier God. ones, like the big, the big yeah. ones that were like tiny. Yeah, yeah. To me, that would be very appropriate for the system, and you could make them derelicts that where there's a mom and pop shop of three people living on some derelict station that. They buy fuel from a star fair that comes in once a month and it's just part of lore and you know they fill you up. That'd be amazing. But um yeah, the Vulcan is the one thing I the ship that's missing. Now, as far as what was said about the expanse being rushed, I don't think this expanse has been rushed at all. Mm -hmm. Um it is clearly well thought out. And the the original concept, what was that, like three years ago? Yeah, when it was originally pitched. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 been around for a long time and um it's very clear by the uh, hollow viewer image they've thought out the mechanical processes within that ship far more than i think they've done with many other ships before that i mean it's it is far more thought out than the prospector was like that little um if you go to the sail page for it the the tractor beam arm that comes out with the tractor beam that's mobile that pulls it in and locks it in and then there's the tube comes out and goes in and sucks the material in like they've actually there are images on that on the site of that process which is and they look really well rendered. Like it looks like it's actually been animated at some point um, for them to test it. So yeah, I think the expanse is um, it may be related to pyro. I don't think they've rushed it. I think it's very planned out. Yeah, very um, convenient. Try to drop it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it was X. I think that uh, had said at one point that he expected it to drop for the um, anniversary sale mm -hmm. um, because the timing with where pyro potentially might fall is just too good. Yeah. At least that's my interpretation of it. I, I also think something like uh, the just, just the Liberator, the Liberator might come out because in effect, the Liberator is just a tube. It's a tube with engines. Super and a, simple. And a, yeah. So so it wouldn't be too difficult for them to implement it just the size. The reason why they wouldn't want to implement it yet is because there's no reason for it. But when Pyro gets introduced, it would probably come in. But I wouldn't expect it to come in when Pyro first gets introduced. I would expect it to come in like the patch or two after that. In fact... Mm -hmm. If Pyro is released when I think it is, which is at least when see it, which CIG seems to be shooting for, which is the end of this year, then I wouldn't be surprised to see the Liberator be released at Invictus next year, which would make sense, kind of correspond with the the whole like when they do, um, you know, patches. So, and, so. Uh, I'll, I guess this is really isn't a lore question; it's more of just a development question, Paul. But, um. When I look at the Carrick, I see assets that are extremely well developed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, clearly it's it's aged a little bit. Um, it it is going to get a pass, but 
in my mind, creating a liberator is far easier because of the blockiness, the anvil style, and just the simplicity of the internals. When you look at all the ships that anvil has, mm -hmm. like when you look at um, freaking Valkyrie, mm -hmm. when you look at the Carrick and you take all those assets, you're just like, I can just move them over and plug them in row of seats, go here, landing mm -hmm. pad, go here. Like, you know, in my mind, it seems like one of the easier ships for them to develop, even regardless of the size. Like it's just all the parts have already been kind of created in a way. I would imagine so. Uh, the 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 question like with with CIG is always it's less of the creation itself and more of the testing and make sure it works. Um, like the Valkyrie, I think the Valkyrie was produced in like three months from from conception to to, to flight because it was specifically for Squadron Forty Two. Wow. So okay. So the Valkyrie was produced really quickly. So if CIG really wants it done, they can get it done. The problem is more the size because the bigger a ship is, the more time you have to put into it. And so it really matter. What really matters is, you know, yeah, you can just put stuff here and there, but you're going to see the seams. You're going to see the, like the places where they're not supposed to be, where they're like clipping into yeah. one another. And so then they have to go through and then kind of polish that out and make sure it looks good, which is the reason why I like the, the Corsair, which in theory is <laughs> super easy because they've done super like what it's, it's got like the, the, the uh, caterpillar like mess hall. It's got a bunch of a assets from the uh, the the uh, the cutlass and the the herald and all of these other Drake ships that exist. But it just it's big, so you, you have to kind of make it work for the space it's in. Otherwise, you get you know yeah. uh, weird sizing issues because I'm sure the mess hall of the Corsair is smaller than the one that would be on the the uh, caterpillar. So you you can't just go drag and drag you know drag and make shrink because then it will just look like your mess table is is a tiny little children's uh you know uh table you know like like a, like a table you see at like an elementary school rather than what it's supposed to be so uh all right next question comes from sandy claus who asks Similar to the Star Starfarer, will we eventually have a ship that will allow fighters and bombers to reload with going back to the station, or without going back to the station, and which will be, um, uh, and which ship will be able to? Uh, Isn't that the Vulcan? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's to a certain at, degree. At the entrance, at least the entrance to that gameplay. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah. a good way to put it. I, the size nine I, torpedo is not going to be on a Vulcan. Yeah. No. I could but, see the Crucible being able to do that. I mm -hmm. could also see them making oh, yeah. a Crucible size dedicated ship. But I I, there's no reason to me that you can't put a torpedo on the repair bay of the Crucible, put your Eclipse in there, and put yeah. the torpedo back on that Eclipse. I mean, definitely the Kraken and the Idris. Like, those are, that's, that's, like literally what the Idris is is designed to do. The reason why it has half of its its length is just for ships is because it's a patrol ship. So it's designed to support at least two to three small fighters uh, on long range, you know, patrols. So yeah, that's, it'd be, that's literally what its job is. I don't know if we'll have something that's a dedicated ship that's just for logistics other than the Vulcan. Um, but CIG seems to, when they find those those blind spots, they fill them pretty quickly. So, yeah, and there are uh, a ton in logistics, by the way. Like that could be a whole other show of just talking about the ships that are missing. Yeah, because there there are clearly ships that are missing in the larger economic and military ranges of, yeah. of support. Like like I've I've said for a long time, the the the, lib <laughs> the Liberator is a ferry ship, but it's a terrible ferry ship because there's no beds. <laughs> like if you're gonna use that for yeah. sailing side, you know you're gonna want a, that to go across systems. Why is there no bed? To have someone I, who can I, log out and just let the, the ship take them where they're going to go, you know? Yeah, I, I hate that it has a pilot ready room and there are no bunks because that's just not a thing. Yeah. It just yeah. isn't a thing. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. This yeah. Could, so this is going to be a short range, like less than a day. Why even bother? <laughs> like, well, and, and, and the other reality of, uh, and anybody in the military can tell you this, um, I've quite literally fallen asleep standing up. In yeah. a particular course, like, and, and I slept three hours along with everybody around me sleeping, standing up. So mm. the idea that you can't have jump seats and log out in them and fall asleep in them, like yeah. that thing is holding me in like a roller coaster seat. I can tell you the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get freaking something, put it into my kit right here and just lay my head down and like, I'm out. Yeah. Like, wake me up when we're like, you know, so many clicks out. Like any, anyone, anyone can tell you, you can fall asleep in chairs because people do it all the time on planes every, every, every day. So, <laughs> and cars every day. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Rule one of the military is to take a nap at every opportunity given. Yes, he, golden rule, he, by the way, of life. Always take naps. Yeah, because you never know when you're going to get them. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> all right, next question comes from uh, Aparki, who asks, uh, do you see colonial gameplay going? Or how do you see colonial gameplay going? Are we going to need to set up supply mm-hmm. chains to attract NPC talent and feed our outposts? Like, uh, like to get a self-sustaining level of gameplay? Yes. Like, um, reputation is so important in this game. I, Mm -hmm. um, I don't think people really understand what reputation is and reputation and and granted, this is my overgeneralization and, and judgment on the community, but, um, reputation for NPCs just isn't for you to get access. It's for NPCs to have access to you. Mm -hmm. So if you are known as a good boss, if you're known as the outpost that has a bar, like when you land your pioneer and you build an outpost, build a bar and a freaking inn immediately. Like you want people to come check you out, like quality of life, man. That's why every ship that I own, like the Nomad, I love the look of the Nomad. I'm weird. I think it has its own click that has external storage. I think that's really valuable for a lot of transportation reasons, but um, because it doesn't have the shorelet, doesn't have a shower. I didn't buy it because like I, 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 and it's the weirdest thing in the world to me. It just doesn't have the quality of life. Like I can't, my character and the NPCs and everyone I would live with, it has this like, beautiful place to sit and I'm going to smell like that doesn't make sense to me. Um, The ability to have like a build a hostel or a bread and breakfast or something on a planet um, quality of life stuff, pool hall, whatever it's going to be is going to be huge. The Carrick, for example, um, that little rec room is poorly designed. It's not great, but it's Mm -hmm. like at least a rec room. Like you can see the value that CIG is going to put into ships. There is a very clear design language. that says, our joint communal food space is going to be comfortable and our, we're going to have a pool table for some reason in a spaceship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but like it's uh, anybody that it's been, um, well, anybody that's been in the military um, can tell you like the little quality of life things make night and day difference of your morale. And to me, that's reputation. Morale is reputation. I, I suspect NPCs are going to have, little sims thermometers that we can't see but they're gonna want food water shower and recreation all met mm-hmm. and if you don't provide that your general attractiveness is for your whatever your operation you're running is a colonial or just a ship that's going to go down and people won't hire on and they won't leave and it's going to be up to you to figure out what uh needs your aren't meeting i, I agree can, with that. can i ask a, can yeah. i uh, ask a follow-on question Sure. Um, I've been in the belief that there will be, and I thought it would be the Genesis. I'm not sure what ship it'll be, but there'll be a recreational ship. Mm-hmm. Because in my view, and this is just purely me speculating, um, you might have a crew of, an, of a mole that's out there, and they might have a shower, food, whatever it's going to be. But slowly over time, like you're talking about, that meter will deplete and their recreation score will go down. And if you don't get them some R&R or some like different, you know, get them off the ship, their morale and their productiveness will go down. Do you, do either of you, like, I, I think I, that'll be a thing. A casino ship? Will it be a thing? You know, uh, 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 hookers and blow ship? Yeah, I think that, I think that something like that will, will happen. Some place where, like, uh, I think that's, that's, that's end game. Like, that's when the, the, once those, those aspects are added into the game, then they'll build something like that. But yeah, for sure. Uh, like, like a, a floating bazaar of some kind. Um, because it makes sense, you know, you're, 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 you know, offer a bar, offer uh, a dance hall, offer food off like a restaurant offer those, those sorts of things. And I'm sure like people a BMM, saying, like a BMM pulling up and just doesn't yeah. land, just floats there with you and people can come on board yeah. and yeah, you might have a spa uh, in your BMM or shop. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the cutty purple is. It's. Yes. Just carries blow <laughs> to keep all your workers going. Yes. Nice. Hey, I've I have uh un, uh like I am still of the belief that we need some sort of um some sort of mercantile ship like the privateer or the um uh the banner merchantman, but in medium uh small, medium, and large sizes. So like a cutty purple being huh. just a configurable yeah. shop where it could be a shop or a bar or a restaurant and turn it into like you know a, a pop up restaurant would make sense because yeah 100 yeah. that's one of my my big end games of like 
Star Citizens finished is that they have every profession and every size category for ship and ideally yeah. multiple competitors of ship in those professions. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the um, MPUV, um, and not it won't be the MPUV if this happens, but that platform and the Aurora platform, I could easily see like a food truck rear or an ambulance rear, or just like mm -hmm. all these different things plugged in. Where like your gut truck, so another military thing on a training base is that a gut truck will pull up and or a construction site, whatever it's going to be, and you know it's hit or miss with a gut truck. Like you could have the best meal you've had freaking in months, or you mm -hmm. could end up sitting in a stall for the next twelve hours. But like the the idea is like I want CIG like CIG to make that. I want like mm -hmm. that type of mechanic where it, it doesn't need to be a player owned ship. It could be just an NPC. You know, you're you're lost in space and or you're on a mining ship, but just a random ship shows up to be like, Hey, would you like some noodles? Benny's yeah. noodles right here. Like, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's kind of what the Benny worship was supposed to be. Um, in terms of like the actual development of, of outposts, I think you're going to see twofold. One, I don't think you're going to see NPCs settling down at outposts or, or kind of like hmm. at settling down at, at small like colonies. I think you're much more likely to see uh, NPCs come attracted to jobs that you can create for them at those locations. But I don't think you'll, they'll come in and be like, oh, I'm going to build a little hound, a home here. I think what you're more likely going to see is players with other players and aid, aided by NPCs. Because the idea of you building, just the logistical support that you're going to need to build something in the middle of nowhere, in and of, in and of itself is going to require a lot of other people to help you. So if you're looking for a place to uh, maybe settle down because you're like, hey, I'm doing a lot of trade between these two systems and I need a place where I can just log out somewhere between, you're probably going to look for a player-owned like outpost or colony where they already have support there, gas, food, uh, supplies. And you'll go there and say, hey, can I build a, 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 like a, a hab and a, and a hangar on this, in, in this area? Because, you know, they'll be like, yeah, sure, pay this amount of money in taxes and you can you can stay here. You know, it's just, it's just a little bit of money will let you stay there. Because collective security will matter more to you than just building a random outpost in the middle of nowhere that you're going to abandon most of the time for other people to find out where it is. <laughs> uh, especially if you want to store anything there. So, you know. Uh, all right. Next question. We've got 17 more questions left. Yeah, sorry. Light, lightning round. Lightning round. We're going to get through this. Um, uh, Hero Shade asks if the whole series of ships are supposed to be big league cargo truckers what's the role of freelancers in small uh, uh, or other small medium cargo ships I'll be right back sure the answer is they're uh, they're like they're like the connies they're they're multi-role yeah ships um, I mean like so we have big 18 wheeler trucks right we also have small box trucks you know that's the, they're the small box trucks of the universe. They're, they're, you're not going to load everything onto a, a, an 18 wheeler. If you're just driving it across town, you're going to drive. If you, you get a little, little, little van effectively. Yeah. Just do that. So, uh, all right. You next can, question. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say you could press the freelancer in a combat or any other role you need as well. You won't do mm -hmm. that with the hull. Yeah. Uh, I got a gecko ask CIG has shown a warehouse units, for surface outposts, assuming that players will be able to construct them for storage, uh, uh, storing various items, how will CIG prevent players from hoarding certain items which can be used to manipulate in-game markets? They won't. Yeah, I, I hope they don't prevent us to. They want you to be able to manipulate in-game markets, but they're going to require a lot of planning. And that if you put something in a warehouse, it's in a warehouse. Anyone can get to that warehouse if they have the right, you know, amount of, amount of firepower. If they know what you're going to do, that you're going to make a run on aluminum and you're just stockpiling aluminum in that system and you're a little outpost, you may risk someone going, hey, let's go fuck up their plans and steal a bunch of aluminum. <laughs> you know? Flashback to Daisy base raids. <laughs> yeah. Or, 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 uh, or, or lull A2 go, go burr. Uh, you know, <laughs> what warehouse? It doesn't exist anymore. Um, so, uh, De Death Trooper 177 asks optional question How far is uh, too far for realism for logistics and gameplay? I think we already talked about that a little bit. Um, it's going to be a fine line. 
It's until you feel the need to go back to college. Yeah. The, the, there'll be a point where you will even see it. you be like, this is too much. Um, which, which is probably further than you think. That point is probably going to be a lot further than most people realize because there are always going to be somebody who goes, who goes, you know what my gameplay idea is? My gameplay idea is loading and unloading cargo. Like, that's what some people want to do. Why? Because it's relaxing for them. You know, they want to be a space, roll, roll with a space forklift, whatever. Um, and they'll get really fucking good at it. And and there'll be more of those people than you realize. And so, you know, you may not like it, but there'll be somebody around who who, who like it. So they'll, they'll reach it to the point where, like, it, the absolute bleeding edge of this is not fun anymore. And then they may pull it back a little bit. Um, all right. Sandy Claus asks, are we going to need to sleep in game? And if so, what will that mean if we need to have multiple pilots similar to a C5 galaxy? All right. I'm going to say this and it's going to get a lot of people angry because they're going to be like, Paul, why did you put that in the universe? I don't think we're going to need to sleep in gang, but I do think that CIG will add sleeping as a mechanic in the same way that logging out of MMOs will give you rest bonuses for XP. Uh, well, it's fine. Steal my comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it. It, yeah, it'll, it'll you'll just, you'll have a, your character will start like their, their hunger meter will go higher. Their th- thirst meter or their, their hunger and thirst meter will go drop faster to the point where you have to eat like every five minutes. If you're just constantly online for, you know, hours and hours at a time, they'll do some things where you're basically debuffed to the, where you almost can't play unless you stop and, and sleep because, all MMOs have that sort of that the mechanic of just go to sleep, go away. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, laws in some Asian countries where like there has to be some sort of time restriction. I know it's like a I think it's a South Korean or Chinese I, I, law. China changes their laws all the times, but yeah. I think South Korea was Internet cafes can only be open for like 12 hours. Yeah, there's there's some there's some limits, and so a lot of games have like limits, hardcore hard encoded limits onto them, where like you can't play past a certain amount of time because of those laws, at least in those countries. And I think that's one of the reasons why like rest bonuses were added because they're like you, people are just gonna twenty four seven this. Um, and that I'll give purpose to actually logging out in a bed too, outside mm-hmm. of just spawning back in there, you get additional bonuses. I'd like to see some type of mechanic where we know that showers and food and eating are going to be a thing, but where if you log out in a bed properly, you when you log back in after so many hours, you're automatically showered, you're automatically fed, yeah, your hydration's 100. So there's a bonus for you for logging out. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and, and for nine to five workers, yeah, you don't want to do those things with your time. You don't want to take the 10 minutes it would take to do all those things potentially, yeah. finding food and doing all those things. So I think it's a really easy win for CIG to make it you know, a benefit to, to players. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be a situation where you like, you have to sleep. So you have to go lay in a bed and watch your character lay in a bed for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> it's not going to be like, Oh, you, you, you go to sleep and you wake up. Like you see in like, um, like your truck simulator where you, you, you do have to sleep in the game, but it's like instantaneous cause it's single player. Um, it, it'll, it'll probably just be the, the MMO logout timer, you know, log timer. Um, Sandy Claus asks, will we see Loadmaster become a profession? Not a CIG official profession, but yes, I think it'll definitely be a profession that p- some players will get really good at. I've been uh, sold on it in this chat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with uh, Aliyah and uh, Gotin asks, with so many new players recently and so many sound like they are focused so much on the dogfighting type of play, how do you feel the heavier reality play, such as load balancing, fuel planning, etc., is going to affect CIG? Or will they change their plans to try to, to hold that audience? If there's one thing I know about CIG, they're going to make the game they want to make. They'll take in feedback and they'll definitely change things if they think it's not, not as fun. But if CIG wants to make this game logistics heavy, you're SOL if you don't like that. They'll just do it. Yeah, this is... <laughs> This is Chris Roberts' game. It is just incidental that we enjoy it too. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, we're we're all looking for more in a game, right? That's why yeah. we're here. Like we we want some of that complexity. But the other thing that CIG's been very clear about, which is 
you know, the, the player portion of the economy is not going to be a substantial portion of the overall economy. So if there is something that is lacking in the game, I could easily see a mechanic where, you know, NPCs take over that role and the game mm-hmm. itself says, okay, there's not enough missiles moving. Well, guess what? You know, this NPC logistics company is moving missiles now and yeah. you just missed out an opportunity to make money. I mean, all that being said, um, I'm a huge pre CU Star Wars Galaxies fan. Like that was my first real MMO I got into. I loved there are things I would never do in it. I wasn't a role player. I didn't like doing certain mm-hmm. things in the game, but I appreciated they were in the game. And I'm a um how to put this? Like um kinetic operations and shooting stuff and doing stuff is something that I do. Mm-hmm. And I have no interest in doing that in this game. Like I have an interest in driving a space truck and doing a couple of other different things, exploring mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I think you're going to see that. You're going to see a lot of players that, you know, although, yeah, a lot of people want to be fighters. They want to be fighter pilots. They want to be the first person shooter guys. Um, and we need them, right? They, they fill out the game. Your real robber barons of the game are going to be your cargo traders. They're going to be your miners. They're going to be your, you know, the, the people that want to play the spreadsheet game. Like I'm going to help organize my org to be the most profitable org ever. And they're going to be the richest people in the game that own the best ships. And yeah, you know, just, they, they play the game that like, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, if you, if you are those people just want to pew pew and dog fight, find an org and let someone else fill in all the other roles for you. And exactly. have a hundred instead times of, better experience. Instead of trying to form your own organization, find an organization that needs somebody who's good at shooting shit and they'll just, they'll give you all the support you need. And then you're good. I'll take, I'll take new pilots. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you have a, uh, an org, like or a group of friends that want to just be your own org, do it. Like Mm -hmm. you could be a very small org and just like contract yourself out to a larger org. Yeah. Like, Hey, we're aligned with you and we're our sub org and we're going to, you need us for a big op. This is how much we charge. Cool, man. Here's the money. We have all your fuel, your armaments. Cool. Just show up and shoot stuff. That's going to be a thing. I mean, you're not going to be able to take a space station without a lot of FPS players there yeah. that S you know, star citizen is not built for them yet. The of war is coming and I think it'll track people, but like, you know, that's having those guys that only want to come in and shoot stuff. They're extremely valuable to the game. Yeah. Um, all right. So next question comes from Pappy Boynton who said, who says, say you're cracking with four, four prospectors, two expanses on a mining operation as a mobile, uh, mobile base. What would be needed for logistics to run an operation like that? Food, fuel, repair. And it's uh, yeah, medical. Um, yeah. Info renders actually, we did an episode recently on like the minimum, what would it take just to survive? And I think that's probably a good base to start with. Like the, the basic mechanics that you need, the ability mm-hmm. to store stuff. Um, you know, you're, you're, look, the things you're going to need that we could get into, but it all is very dependent on where you're at and what you're doing. So security is a big thing, um, but security is going to be dependent on what you're doing, how far your supply ships are traveling, those type of things. Yeah. Um, you, you, you need people, uh, yeah, you're going to need people to do those things. Like you're going to need somebody who has, who is a repairer, someone who is job yeah. is to repair ships. You're going to need someone who's refueling and reloading and doing all those sorts of things as well. Like that's their job. Someone who's in the, the turret seats fighter pilots who are patrolling the area to make sure they're safe. You, you need people, you know, more than you need. You need resources, but people are your resources. So, um, either NPCs or, care, or players. Uh, Santa Claus asks, do we need more government red tape, transport licenses, insurance, landing fees, parking fees, storage fees, etc.? Yeah, and we're going to get yes. that. Yeah. It's all planned, so. Uh, it's it's it, even an like economy a- drain, and it opens up gameplay for people who don't want to follow the laws. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah they... it's, it's reputation. Yeah. Like it's reputation gameplay is going to be very deep. Pyro, for example, will probably, there'll probably be some NPC organization that charges you a fee for operating in Pyro. And they'll mm-hmm. all charge you and you have to figure out which one you're going to align with and it's going to be fun. Just adds depth. We've got nine client questions left. Um, <laughs> uh, Del Anar asks, do you think CIG will add an um, effigy commodity to pyro so that we may spread the word of the prophet. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, um, their lore just came out this week where that there's a there's a voice that's heard in the minds of Pyro 2 that supposedly predicts the future. 
And so people have literally claimed the the, um, the 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 mantle of the prophets that the prophet told them that they were going to take Ruin Station and started wars over it. So, um, yes, yes, uh, I think I think you'll definitely have uh, have have the 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 little plushy uh, fire rats that you'll buy for for. <laughs> I spent time in the in in the in the pyro two mines. Um, as, a, as a founder of a pico cult. Be prepared for religious crusades in Pyro now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there were already religious crusades in Pyro. There have been multiples of them um, <laughs> that caused lots of chaos. Uh, all right. Delinar asks, uh, IRL cost of ships on the pledge store certainly matters now when it comes to considering ships. But what will that cost matter in? Uh, but will that cost matter later in game as more ships are available in game, and it becomes even more feasible to just buy in game? Yes and no. There are always going to be scarcity. You're going to have some ships like the Idris, which you just will not see a lot in game to purchase. It'll be very rare to find them, and and like limited ships like the M50, you won't be able to find all of them, and you also might need reputation to buy them. So being able to, to pull out that credit card and swipe it and get that in game may, may still be valuable and that price will gonna matter as well. What do y'all think? I'm not gonna advocate for spending money. Only only spend <laughs> to the point you're getting enjoyment out in the game. Yeah. As yeah. yeah. So I mean that's all I have to say. <laughs> I, I would add to that, and this is not an encouragement to spend money, but like certain ships, my personal belief is like BMMs, railings, like things that are manufactured in alien space with alien manufacturing are probably going to be harder to come by in game. Yeah. So if you really want that BMM, like like me, I had a, um, a original concept by my buybacks that I just got back. And mm. I did that because of the work that they've recently done on it. It looks great. And um, yeah, I have no regrets because it's going to be an amazing ship. But like would I pay cash for what it is now without lifetime insurance? No, no. personally. Yeah, and I think I think it'll depend on your personal things. I think every ship in game it will be achievable, except for I think what was the 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 Vanduul scythe you have to you know capture, but you'll probably be able to capture them. Um, no, even now the ships you're purchasing with money isn't worth the money you're paying because they're just not. But there will always be someone who purchases it for the right price. Um, so there will there will always be some some consideration about real life pricing. Sandy Claus asks, cargo haulers don't usually own the actual cargo. So in the future, haulers will have to hold on uh, to, to take bids on hauling jobs. Yes, that's what the TTD, TDD is. The Trade and Development de- Department? Um, I can't remember what, what, what it's called, but the TDD is where you're going to go find those sorts of jobs. So we already talked that about will that be a majority of the, the, the yeah. cargo commodities that, that- are transported you will not i mean i think i said this before but like you won't buy it's not going to be what it is now you're not going to yeah. fill up your hold with something and speculate it's going to be you're hired for a job you put out bids or contract bids and somebody says i'm going to pay you this much to move this to here from there and hopefully cig will give you the ability to negotiate a little bit like mm-hmm. a slider you say well i'm willing to do it for this much and they might say no they might say yes your reputation is good you can move the slider higher and higher mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, I hope they do those things, but the reality is going to be is that you're going to be hired for a job. Yeah. Uh, all right. Sleazy Meyer asks, curious question. Does Star Citizen have plans to adopt in, uh, an in entirely commodities-driven system? In X-Force, uh, if you say whole parts or advanced electronics are, sor- uh, are short, you have issues outfitting ships or buying ships in general. Do you see CIG taking the things to this level? Yes. You... You've just described quantum. Like is the Chris basis. Roberts making a complicated game? No. No. <laughs> um, Chris is going even further than that, though, because each ship is being mapped out. One of the reasons why we don't see damage systems yet, why we haven't seen like the new damage thing, is because each ship needs to be made of certain materials, and those materials need to be tracked in game, so that like you know, say uh, a Hornet may be twenty percent titanium. So you each Hornet's going to cost a certain percentage of titanium, so you have to have titanium for that Hornet. Um, so if you're repairing that ship as well, you're going to need to know what type of materials went into making that ship so you can replicate those materials to repair pieces. And um, though the, the, what 
the base components of every item in game is made out of is going to determine the prices of those items. And then they're going to let the economy run from there. So, yeah. And, and I think he's going to make it even more complex where, like, you might own a Crucible, but you may not have the schematics to repair Hornet. Like, you might have to invest in, like, buying the information. You know, like, the, mm. the for, for, for people that repair cars, the Chilton manuals, like, the... Yeah. Like, yeah, here's how you actually repair this. Like, oh, I didn't know I needed to buy that. And yeah, you, you could have, I could easily see like Pyro, for example, Hornet pulls up to a crucible. Good, I'm saved. Like, I don't know how to fix your ship. I don't have the materials. Mm -hmm. um, and I easily see Chris making it that complex. Um, like even to the point where if you've repaired 100 Hornets, you might repair the ship more quickly than you would if you've only repaired two. It's just from practice too, you know, like, oh yeah, this, that canard falls off every single time. And you're just like, boop, 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 you know, your first time took you five minutes, but you know, your hundredth, it's taking you like 30 seconds, you know, and just moving along. Um, there's a question in chat, which I'll ask as well. People will cry pay to win if they artificially limit access to certain ships in game. Just look at the F8. How will they justify that? They're not limited. They're just reputation based to play the game and you get access to it. Um, and the key with the F8, for instance, is the F8, unless you purchase a certain amount of money, you don't get it, but you're not even getting the F8, you're getting the F8C. And if you play Squadron 42, you'll get the ability to purchase it in-game. It'll basically give you the reputation boost enough so you can buy it in-game. But you won't just get it for completing Squadron 42. There's going to be need something for people to play. And just because I own an F8 doesn't mean I'm good at it. <laughs> like yeah. and if it's going to require some skill just having a ship that's that has a lot of guns doesn't mean you automatically win um, if you asked um anybody that played galaxies in the pre-cu days if there was a pay to win button you'd have a lot of people that would claim the jedi had a pay, pay to win button mm -hmm. and then if you actually had a jedi tune which i did um you were constantly running you were constantly hunted um, you constantly couldn't show your face. You had to actually, you, you spent more time planning on how you play your game than actually playing the game. So in my view, when I think of Chris designing a game and, and the, the team designing a game, um, I win is relative. Like the, the trader might have an I win because he can hire 15 F8s to hunt you down and kill you. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a far more complicated game than an I win button for just owning a ship. Yeah. Um, and people will, will cry pay to win anyways, even if it, it has no sure. no basis yeah. in that, you know. Um, think, think of it as like a like a javelin. A javelin is $1,000. You go, oh, javelin, you automatically win. It's like a javelin requires 100 crew members. Like, you don't just need a javelin. You need to pay 100 people to, to crew or, or hire 100 NPCs. And even then, if you have 100 NPCs, that doesn't mean you're going to win. It just means that you have to order every one of those NPCs around because otherwise they'll just do whatever you set them to default as there's going to be a lot more complexity in the game, especially as the, you know, the more expensive ships or other things come in there. You know? And as we said, an F8 is fine, but an F8 is a fighter that's designed to be launched off of carriers. You're not just going to go, Oh, I win because you're going to have to refuel, repair, rearm that thing. And it's range it's, is limited. So, and it's skill. Like, like you said, it's skill, the fighter pilot. But in addition to that, like um, I play a game, um, that's a Crytek game, hunt, hunt, hunt showdown. Down. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy it. And people will kill you with the dumbest crap. And, you know, you might have the best weapon loadout. You might have spent a ton of money on it. You you should be paid to win because you have the the weapon that will kill everybody. And somebody with a freaking um, trap will hit you in the head and kill you. Um, that happens. And it's the skill of the player balanced with just the chaotic nature of a game that's complex. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody yeah. might get lucky and kill you no matter how much you've paid to play the game. I think it's what we're not hitting on is play to win is defined about what your end state is for the game. Mm -hmm. So if you want to collect oh, all the ships yeah. and you're done, it's pay to win. If you have my goals to have CIG acknowledge me and my stupidity, <laughs> I can buy all the ships and make them a million dollars. I'm not winning my game yet. Yeah, exactly. In a game like Star Citizen, which is a sandbox, what 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 you play is the is the whatever you want to play uh like like galaxies is a good example of that as well yeah like being playing in galaxies you know you could be want to be a jedi that's cool you can you can try to do that but that doesn't mean you win if you're a jedi uh you know you yeah, could just you open could some new gameplay yeah if you, you could want to want to settle create your own town you could do that but that doesn't mean because you created your own town doesn't mean you win you know 
I am too young for all these galaxy references. I know. Sorry, man. <laughs> I, I was I was just old enough to play it, but I was just like a teenager when that came out. And uh, it's one of those games that we that's the closest you're going to see to Star Citizen reference it all the time. Uh, it's just because of how good it is. Like it mm, was very. It, it's, a lot it, of depth. It was it was Star Citizen before Star Citizen in terms of just how much complexity and experience you could have with it. So, um, it's like if I had a forty, I'd pour one out for it right now. Yeah, I mean, it's still going on just in private service. Yeah, the emulators. Yeah, yeah. And every so many years, I go back to them and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And then I play for a while and I'm like, I don't have time for this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm it's not so young. complex. You're like, how did I ever like? Now I have kids. There's no way I can play this game. <laughs> uh, honestly, pay to win is more like weapons I put on ships to give me benefits, like twenty percent more damage or something. Uh, you'll see that even, but you won't. The CIG won't pay for, won't, won't charge but, like, that. It's relative, like, right? Yeah. Like you might overclock your weapons to be twenty percent more deadly, but then like your weapon might degrade more quickly, which is something mm-hmm. CIG said. So you're paying money, it degrades more quickly, you're spending more money, you're killing NPCs, you might be winning more, but are you getting the same return as the guy who's building the budget pyro loadout of laser weapons because he knows he can't get resupply ballistics or missiles? Like it's a yeah. you know, pay to win is very like like Commander said, it's very relative. It's like what are you trying to actually do in the game? All right. Um, okay, another question. Sandy Claus asks, how how can player-owned slash ran warehouses be used in a logistics chain as, as a possible profession? Um, if you were running like a, an operation, say uh, a trucking organization, just you're, you're, you pick up uh, stuff point A, go to point B, and you have little uh, logistics bases that just have Vulcans at them, um, that, that the logistics base is going to need like refuel, repair, you know, materials. And if your ship, if one of your ships is passing by and runs out of gas, boom, you got a fast response. It can go straight there. That tow truck can get there, get fill it up with enough fuel to get to its next next spot and go go along. Um, you can also hoard resources, you know, like, hey, we need to have this many resources here <laughs> so that things, things happen. But what's up, best? Here. Let me refresh it real quick. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm yeah, internet connection stuff. Um, you know, the, uh, as far as like, well, to the thing you said about hoarding resources, yeah. um, I, I don't necessarily believe that you'll be able to hoard resources because I think it's like, what, 20% of the economy is player controlled? Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. But I mean, like, you might be able to, refer, uh, you might be able to hoard like, um, for like one system, you know, like, like, a small system to, to control or have the be, be a place where you can have a lot of like, let's just say titanium. For instance. Okay. Let's just say t- titanium is valuable f- because it's used in the repair of a certain, you know, of, of all ships. Well, if you're the place that has the most titanium, you're going to have the smallest, the cheapest pricing because you have the most supply of it um, for repairs, you know, that, that kind of thing as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I if if we're talking about like having a warehouse and like storing stuff, yeah, I don't see that being a thing in the game. Um, potentially for like if you've built an outpost with the pioneer, mm-hmm. maybe like for surrounding, you can sell to NPCs or people traveling yeah. through. Um, but I could see like I, I really hope one day we have player built like some type of space station, mm-hmm. like the ability to build a rest stop yourself as a player or an organization. Yeah, at that point, I could definitely see it. Um, the ability to have a warehouse or a, or a hub distribution point that you strategically place to to change the economy of a you know a particular system. I I hope we have that. Do I think it's going to happen like anytime soon? No. I mean, we're talking like after you know beta alpha freaking is gone and we're playing a real game. Yeah, I could see that maybe happening years down the line. Okay. Uh, Rogue Comet asks, do you think we'll get proper communication systems in game for logistics or are we going to have to use, uh, out of game to, uh, proper to, uh, job of it, to do a proper job of it? I will, I will take the lead here. Yeah. I could see them adding a communication system. Their problem is, is they have to be discord and I don't see (laughs) sky G being better than discord as it stands. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think it's, it's pug. 
I think your, your communication system is for pugs. It's for random people you meet and for, for people who you just pick up gamers, people you, you're, you're just throwing them on a ship and having them do stuff. But yeah, I think Discord will always be, Discord, TeamSpeak, those, those sources will always beat um, CIG, whatever CIG does. Um, 99% of what needs to happen with planning logistics doesn't need to happen within a game. Yeah. So by the nature of that and the simplicity, I mean, I'd agree with, with both of them. I, I, I don't see any system they could develop within Star System being better than something they could do outside of it. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, yeah. And as Macton said, there's no way I'm inviting randoms off game comms. Yeah, exactly. You're, if you're going to see a random, you're going to talk with them in game um, rather than give them your personal discord or whatever. Uh, Steve B dancer asks, do you worry about the game being a uh, you versus quantum to get missions, deliveries, and possibly mining? Uh, no, <laughs> I've interpreted quantum being more of what generates missions more yeah. than them claiming it. Yeah. I, it would be nice if there could be a competition. That might be nice to see if you yeah. could get in front of it or underbid NPCs. Yeah. I, I, I could see that being a very easy mechanic they could put in the, the competition with NPC players, you know, organizations, whatever it's going to be. But like, yeah, does, does it frighten me in the game? No, because theoretically CIG will do it right. And yeah, you're not really competing with a non-existing entity. You're competing with yourself. Like what are you trying to do? Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's at least initially, it's going to be, these are the missions that are generated because of these things that need to happen right now we, in game. We actually see this in 317. If there is more activity around a sp specific location, because quanta, the quanta are acting there, you'll get the uh, ECN alerts will pop up in those locations more frequently. So if you're in an area that you see a bunch of ECN alerts, you know that the quanta are there. The trade convoy, the trade quanta are there. The pirate quanta are there as well. And if, if you participate in those missions, you'll help reduce the amount of pirate quanta in that region. And eventually, if you go back to that area, you know, the next day, you may not have nearly as many, as many ECN missions because the quanta is already piled into that area and then, then dried out because, you know, the, the trader stopped going there, that sort of thing. That's the in, first initial version of the dynamic mission system is right now is the ECN alert generation. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're competing against all of the security forces. It just says that now there's a, bigger, a gr greater probability for that mission to spawn in that region. I think it's what's more like it. So, all right, that was the last question. Um, we we took a thirty minute a thirty minute uh, 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 regular show and an almost two hour <laughs> question and answer session. Yes. Um, <laughs> so thank you all for for coming in. Thank you for asking all those questions. I want to thank uh, Commander uh, again, Apex Crime Stat um, and um, L uh, 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 SA who uh, from, from you know, Info Runners and such. Uh, and thank you for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, again, make sure you like this. Like this it helps a lot to spread the word. Comment down below with your own questions and comments. Uh, and uh, if you really enjoy this, subscribe. Come join us live every Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern for um, uh, to ask your own questions. And uh, yeah, like I say every time, hope to see you someday in the black. <laughs>